Welcome everyone to this uh, special Europark webinar today. Uh, my name is Esther Bossink. I'm Europark's communications manager and our webinar today will focus on how the war has affected Ukrainian protected areas. We were approached some weeks ago by our regional partners, uh, our regional section, Europark Spain, if we could host this webinar. And we are of course very happy to do so. I will be mostly in the background today uh, helping with the technical side of things and um, conservation expert Pep Amengual will be the facilitator of this webinar. Our expert speaker from Ukraine in, is Anastasia Rapaluk and uh, Pep will introduce her a little bit more in a few seconds. So just before we get started, um, just a few house rules. Um, as you might have heard upon entering this room, um, this webinar is being recorded, so um, if you don't feel comfortable with potentially showing up on the recording, you're of course free to close your camera, but we welcome you to open it just because it, it gives a little bit more of a personal feeling to, to the webinar. And there will be space for questions after the presentation, so please write them in the Zoom chat box. Um, there will not be any interventions. You will not be able to unmute yourself for this webinar today. At the end of the webinar, I will also share a short feedback form. And this is very important for us to yeah, continuously improve our work and your input there is very valuable. As I said, the webinar is being recorded and the recording and the presentation will be made available both on our website as well as um, you will receive it in your inbox in the upcoming days. So just super quickly for those that do not know us, um, I'm working for the Europark Federation. Um, we are the largest network of protected areas in Europe and we have around 400 members in 40 countries, um, yeah, all over Europe and even beyond Europe. And our vision is a sustainable nature valued by people. And to facilitate that, we create networking events, we create programs, projects, um, and yeah, things like this, a webinar like this, of course, on a topic that is very important to us. We realize that war is also an environmental issue and Europark truly is founded on the belief of peace and international cooperation and dialogue. And um, that's at the very core of our organization. And that's why we're also very happy to be able to yeah, host this webinar today. Um, you can find us, of course, online. You're very welcome uh, to join our upcoming events. Um, for example, our annual conference, which will take place this year in the Netherlands and will be quite a special one as we are also celebrating our 50th anniversary. And yes, all of our work is really to help protected areas um, reach their maximum potential and support them in whatever way we can. And um, I hope that this webinar will be a further step towards international cooperation, towards dialogue. And um, yeah, that, that was my very short introduction. I thank you very much for joining us today. I will hand over the floor now to Pep and I wish you all a very informative and, and pleasant webinar. So Pep, over to you. So thank you very much, Esther. And welcome to the audience, to this uh, seminar. I'm quite excited about it. And first of all, I would like to thank again uh, you, uh, Esther and Martha from Europark, because without your very sensitive help and support, this, this seminar would not have been possible. And uh, let me, to frame a little bit the presentation, let me give just uh, some brief information. Ukraine is a member of the Council of Europe, is a member of, of Europe, of course, and is a member of the Council of Europe. And some of their protected areas have been awarded with the European Diploma for Protected Areas of the Berne Convention, especially or particularly the Carpathian Biosphere Reserve. Many areas also are uh, a number around 377, if I'm not wrong, are um, included in the Emerald Network of the um, Council of Europe as well. So um, just to frame this, this uh, the situation of, of, of Ukraine in the context of the European protected areas. So as I see it, uh, the war is the ultimate breakdown of uh, mankind uh, and its language is made of casualties, of injured and displaced civilians, of destruction of in infrastructures 
and the wiping of uh, towns and entire cities. But it also has a dramatic effect on the environment. Uh, a study published in 2009 in conservation biology showed that in the 20th century, 80% of the conflicts in the world took place in hotspots of biodiversity, um, so affecting strongly the nature and the protected areas. And these effects are long lasting uh, in many cases. In Europe and after two world wars, uh, there are thousands of sites which are still poisoned a century later, the end of, of these conflicts, uh, by the stow of chemicals and explosive of high potence and, uh, um, and the deliberate of accidental uh, dumping of them into the ground waters and soils which after so many years are still in some cases useless for agriculture. And this is the case, for example, of Ypres in Belgium, but also the countryside in Chechenia has suffered strongly from, from these recent conflicts. Additionally, the environment and the natural resources can be used directly by the contenders as a weapon. And unfortunately, uh, this has happened also in Ukraine, as we will see later in the presentation of Anastasia. So Ukraine has not been an exception. The war has had a tremendous impact on the natural values of the country from the very beginning of the conflict, on the invasion. But there has been a tipping point after the intentional blasting of the Kokovka Dam in the Dnipro River. Uh, so days after this uh, event, which took place a few weeks ago, uh, I send a message of support to the Ukraini Ukrainian Nature Conservation Group. It's an NGO which is a local NGO, a Ukrainian NGO, which is doing a remarkable job uh, supporting the development and uh, the management even of the protected area systems in Ukraine, hand by hand with the Ukrainian Ministry of Environment. And this email, this modest uh, expression of interest and of support gave uh, food, uh, opened the possibility of preparing a seminar, this seminar, to gain visibility about this important uh, issue. So this is uh, the reason why we are here today. So to talk about this important topic, I would like to welcome Ms. Anastasia Drapalnuk, uh, a current member of the Ukrainian Nature Conservation Group. Uh, so good morning, Anastasia. And let me introduce you briefly. Uh, you are an economist, and correct me if I say something wrong, for sure. <laughs> You are an economist and master in management of protected areas by the University of Klagenfurt in Austria. You are currently working for the UNCG, this uh, uh, local NGO, but before you worked for more than 10 years in the Ministry of Environment of Ukraine uh, in the planification of new protected areas, uh, uh, nine new national parks and the upgrade of an additional number of 13. Uh, you have also led the team that, that has upgraded the Emerald Network in Ukraine, but you have also worked with uh, protected species or with endangered species. You are responsible for the management plan of the black stork in Ukraine, of the population of black stork in Ukraine, and the sturgeon in the Dnipro River. And finally, you had a leading role in the definition of Polesia, the transboundary uh, protected area between Belarusia, uh, Poland, and uh, Ukraine. So uh, before leaving you the floor, Anastasia, let me make you one very short and brief question. It's the only one I'm going to make. I will leave the questions to the audience for sure. And it's a personal question. And Anastasia, I would like to know what has meant to you personally and professionally uh, to your professional life uh, as a manager and as a conservationist the 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 war uh, since february uh, 2022 so anastasia you have the floor thank you very much pep and thank all people who come to listen about our uh, situation in ukraine and uh, biodiversity and natural protection and um, uh, about your question i can tell that war did not catch me by surprise I were prepared for, uh, I knew I knew that it could happen and were prepared for this. 
Uh, my whole family, even the pets, uh, moved to safe place, and I decided to stay in Kyiv. In this time, I worked in Ministry of Environmental Protection of Ukraine, and from first days of uh, full-scale Russia invasion, I was responsible for cooperation with all, all national park and reserve in Ukraine. Uh, at first, it was like uh, unless calls, phones, uh, messages, and so on, and we tried to cooperate to help each other. Uh, one part uh, asked to, to help them, other parts could help them. Uh, people ask it about fuel uh, to fill the uh, car. Uh, people ask it about food because they had not food in some time, even food. Uh, people had not uh, 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 special equipment to heat uh, their home and so on and so on. A lot of people move on all country and around the country and uh, out of the country need help because they, they didn't prepare for this. Uh, and uh, we tried to organize all these things, and I had no time to afraid about something. I have not time uh, to think about what will happen tomorrow. Uh, I only work it, work it, work it, and it's helped me. And one issue that I want to raise is. Um, Mm, people who work in establishing of protected area will understand me. Uh, when you, you establish and you succeed in establishing in pro of protected areas, you think that it is forever. You admire of your work and you think that next generation and next generation will admire also of You spent 10 years to establish of some protected areas could be destroyed. And for me, especially for me and for a lot of people who work with protected areas, uh, this fighting, it's not only against of uh, Russia Federation, but it's this fighting for uh, natural protection and for protected areas that we established before and managed before uh, the fire started. Thank you. <laughs> It's look like so thank you very much and mm -hmm. proceed with your presentation. Thanks a lot. See okay. you later. Okay, I will try. Could you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's perfect, Anastasia. Okay. Before starting to explain the situation with protected areas and biodiversity during the war in Ukraine. I will explain general information about protected area system in Ukraine. It consists uh, um, about uh, 80,000 square kilometers and it's 40% of all territory of Ukraine. Uh, there, is, uh, there are weapons of international importance, uh, 22 size, uh, sites uh, with thousands, more than 7,000 square kilometers, UNESCO World Heritage sites, uh, 50 components uh, parts uh, of uh, this uh, heritage and eight biosphere reserve, four of them transbordery biosphere uh, of UNESCO, UNESCO biosphere reserve. And as uh, Pep told, uh, 377 uh, sites uh, of Emerald network uh, uh, that include more than 80,000 square kilometers and protect the national protected areas and local protected areas. Uh, uh, the amount of them is more than 8,000 uh, sites and it's cover uh, 41,000 uh, square, square kilometers. Uh, if you compare this with area of all Ukraine, it's not a big area, and most of European country uh, have biggest percent of uh, protected areas. But when you compare with the country and with the uh, uh, land that they cover, uh, this area uh, could be comparing with most of European countries. Uh, and uh, if you speak about national and local protected areas, uh, we have um, uh, classification of protected areas. Uh, um, it's uh, national parks, natural reserves, 
uh, regional landscapes, parks, uh, 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 and other protected areas. And you can see on the picture uh, four uh, images of protected areas. Uh, and I could tell you that uh, three of them now uh, have the problem and uh, in dangerous or because of war. And when we speak about the damage, of uh, protected areas and biodiversity, uh, I will start uh, from uh, explaining the damage to the environmental uh, as whole. Uh, during 60 months, more than uh, uh, our government calculated that more than 20, uh, uh, 52 billion uh, uh, was damaged to the Ukrainian uh, by, uh, environment. Uh, uh, when you su see the pictures, uh, I can explain you. In the first of pictures, you see uh, dolphins. Uh, it's a big problem in the Black Sea. Uh, some scientists uh, tell that uh, about uh, nine, about uh, nine hundred species, uh, 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 nine hundred uh, species were died during the war, but some scientists speak, uh, tell that about uh, 30,000 species died during the war. Nobody know exactly uh, the reason why they die, but it's uh, more more bigger than a normal time. On next picture, you see uh, the elk uh, that died uh, in uh, Drevlyansky uh, Natural Reserve because of uh, explosion of mind. And all the last two pictures you see the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fire in the forest area. Uh, when we speak about protected areas and the influence of the of protected areas, uh, I could tell that uh, we calculate uh, the protected the amount of protected areas that could have influence or bad influence of war. But exactly we don't know this information because most most of protected areas we could not uh, come and could not see what happened with them. Uh, some protected areas uh, now under uh, permanent occupation you see on the map it's a red color. Some of them they occupied, but they uh, mined and need to be uh, damned. Uh, it's uh, blue color, and only information that we can collect is green color. And some some places on the uh, on the uh, uh, blue color. Uh, it's include about six and a half sites covering 6,000 square kilometers of more than 80 uh, of all Ramsar sites, 80% of all Ramsar sites in Ukraine. 160 Emerald Network sites with an area of 29,000 square kilometer and more of 30 of all Emerald Network, 30% of all Emerald Network in Ukraine and 90 protected areas of national or local importance with an area of 12,000 square kilometers or about 30%. Uh, uh, you could not uh, uh, take all this uh, protected areas together, but because they overlap, but general information like this. And to explain all situation in Ukraine about the damage caused by the war for protected areas and biodiversity, uh, we could not tell general information as I told, but I could show you examples of some protected areas. Uh, I will start with Kimbur Peninsula uh, that's situated in Kherson and Mykolaiv region. Uh, it's a very unique area. You can see on the map how it looks like and the picture how it looks like. Uh, it's a place where 30 uh, kinds of species of uh, bird where, where they uh, uh, rest and uh, breed, and uh, during the war, more than uh, about 50, uh, uh, 50 squ uh, square kilometers were burned. Uh, the habitats, nesting sites of approximately 100 bird species were destroyed, uh, and it, it was uh, not enough for this area. Uh, some weeks ago, 
more than south square kilometers remained flooded uh, uh, because of Kachovska hydropower plant dam plast. Uh, and this area is a uh, black sea biosphere reserve, uh, Ivory Coast uh, of Svetoslav National Natural Park, Kinburs uh, Spread uh, Regional Landscape Park, Ramsar Sites, Emirate Site, very unique area. We could not come at this place because it's uh, on the uh, 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 occupation and uh, we could uh, collect information all, only from satellite. Next part, Sveti Hora National Nature Park, Donetsk region. Uh, it's also unique territory because uh, it look like hills uh, covered by, by forest, wetlands, rivers, and it's not common for this region uh, because it's steppe region uh, and a lot of unique habitats in this area and also uh, plants and other, sp and, uh, other species. And during the war, they are almost destroyed. Russia invaders uh, destroyed 80% of the park, up to 60 uh, or 70 or percent of the pine forest or about 50 square kilometers have, has been destroyed. You can see on the picture how it looked like. And on the first picture, uh, it is natural habitat, uh, Pinus sylvester forest on chalk, chalk in the step zone, which is protected under the Bern Convention. And you see that it's destroyed almost. And uh, on the last picture, you see uh, the building of National Park, how it's destroyed and all equipment, all cars, all buildings were destroyed or stolen by Russia army. Uh, next national park that I want to show what happened with this is Kaminska Sich National Natural Park, Kherson region. On the picture, you can see the difference between, between how it looked like before the fire and how it, how it looked now. Um, uh, uh, according to our calculation, again, uh, from satellite information, uh, six uh, square kilometers of valuable areas where rare plant species were growing, uh, had burned. And uh, after explosion of uh, Kachovska hydropower plant, uh, the water level dropped approximately by uh, more than 13 meters. And most of territory uh, uh, start to look like desert. You see this picture. And now we will jump to Ascania Nova Biosphere Reserve in Kherson region. It's unique territory. I think you have about this territory. It's UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, Ramsar sites, Emerald site. Unique steppe habitats uh, also in this area, steppe depression body. Uh, and uh, this territory could not uh, be alone without people because it's semi, uh, the, the animal live in this area in semi wild condition. And people uh, have to, who manage this area, have to live uh, uh, in this area even because it was occupied because if nobody will care about this animal, they will die. Uh, this situation was also during the Second War, uh, and uh, in this time, it could survive with this, all animals. But now we don't know what will happen. During uh, all year, we collect money from all organizations and people of the world to help these protected areas to uh, to food the animals uh, and uh, to care about these animals. But we will hope that it will survive. Now, uh, we have not information about damage of this area. And when uh, uh, also I want to explain to you some words about uh, consequences of terrorist attack of Russia Federation on the Kakovska hydropower station. Uh, generally, on the map, you can see on the green color, uh, we, uh, the protected area system in this area. This area very unique for protection of biodiversity. Uh, most of this area uh, covered by uh, different protected areas. 
uh, and uh, there are about five national parks, uh, two regional landscape parks, uh, one biosphere resource, eight emerald sites, four Ramsar sites, and one biosphere reserve. I have to mention that uh, on the national legislation, biosphere resource is not the same like UNESCO biosphere reserve because we speak uh, uh, always one biosphere reserve on the national legislation and one biosphere reserve, uh, UNESCO biosphere reserve. Uh, all this area cover about 4,000 square kilometers, very, very, very big territory. And the influence is depend of where the territory is situated, up or down of uh, Kachovska Dam. Uh, the territory that's situated up of Kachovska Dam, uh, uh, where uh, now look almost like desert. Uh, if you, uh, uh, if, when uh, on this area, uh, we have uh, two Ramsar sites and they destroyed almost and all by diversity of Kachovska uh, reservoir uh, were died. If you look on the uh, lower part of Dnipro River, uh, is all territory where uh, all territory were flooded. Uh, all islands on the Danube Delta were flooded, and of course, all biodiversity, all species that could not fly were died. And uh, uh, when we speak uh, about biodiversity, it's include about 38, 38 types of natural habitats protected by under resolution four of the Bern Convention, 82 species of animals and plants protected under resolution six of Bern Convention, and 251 other species of wild animals and plants with various conservation status according to the national or international red list. Uh, and when uh, when we uh, uh, put this uh, amount of damage on the money, we try to do this, our government tried to do this, it costs about 3.7 billion euro. Uh, all of protected areas were destroyed, and we don't know if they will return on the natural on the natural state. Uh, most of fish died, and scientists uh, tell that uh, all population of fish we, uh, 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 were destroyed. Uh, most of no location of the rare end species. Limoterpium, uh, Mercepalium, and other species were also destroyed. 70% of the world population of Northman's uh, beach mouse has been flooded, uh, and so on. You can see on the pictures, uh, the, uh, on the pictures what happened with reptilian and uh, amphibious population. Uh, first pictures uh, uh, is made in National Park, um, a national park on Odessa region, uh, and second picture was in Kamenska Sich National Park, uh, and also uh, a lot of breeding, uh, breeding nesting colonies were also died because it's the time where the nest is not ended. And you can see other species on the picture that could be disappear uh, because in this area were a lot of endemic species. And one week ago, or maybe more, uh, we had an expedition to the National Park, Kaminska Sich National Park, and where we checked uh, the situation that happened in this area. Uh, we established a 12 monitoring plot to monitor how the, how the nature will recover. And good information that nature start to recover, you can see on the picture, uh, how some plants start to grow, but the bad information that most of them is in Wise. We found six kinds of species in this area. And some words about protected area stuff, how, how they work during the war. Uh, the team of uh, protected area staff, uh, it's about 7,000 people of all country. 
uh, they tried from first day to work uh, and to protect for, from first first day of the war to protect the protected areas and biodiversity but also they start to help people uh, who had to move from their place some of these uh, uh, persons who work in protected areas uh, have not uh, a place where to live uh, some of them have to move from this place uh, but they still work they organize scientific work they prepare ecological education work they also uh, uh, try to preserve the nature to fight against fire and so on if it's possible and if it's safety for them uh, all they uh, work uh, together like one team uh, and uh, some managers rangers and scientists serve in the army force of Ukraine because their skills very good, uh, very, very helpful on the army. And some words about future. From first day, we start to think what to do with uh, recovering of uh, nature and biodiversity in Ukraine. It, it's very difficult because we don't know the situation, and every day the situation starts to worse, to be worse and worse. But uh, we try to prepare and we change every time when, when we uh, meet, we establish special group in the frame of all Ukrainian group for, about preparing of uh, plan for recovering of Ukraine. And our proposal to work not only on uh, restoring of nature or restoring of place, uh, damaged place, our proposals also to uh, change the whole system of protected areas. It's mean uh, to implement European Union nature conservation legislation uh, and establish a high quality system of protected areas taking in, into account the consequences of the war and uh, to change the governance and management uh, both at the national and local level in accordance with the best European and world practice. And I could tell that biodiversity restoration will be one of the most important challenge after the liberation of the Ukraine's territory. The process will take decades or perhaps even centuries and will require the assistance of many scientists and conservation from all of European and the world. Uh, and we uh, we uh, hope that we will rebuild and restore uh, our country and of course our nature uh, like part of uh, European continent. And we try to work on international level. Uh, when I tell about we, I tell that it's government, NGOs, scientists, all together. We work on the national level on the international level, on the organization level, and even on the individual level. But we, do, we still don't know what to do with all the things and with this, we need the help. And some words about our organization, uh, Pep already told about it. You can find in more information on the, uh, our website, Facebook, and so on. You can find this link on this, uh, on this slide. And last but not least, I want to tell so thank you of of European uh, um, environmentalists, of governments, of uh, of all European countries, and also NGOs, scientists, workers of, uh, of protected areas for helping us. Without this helping, we could not work. We could not protect our. Uh, protected areas and it's admire us to work even in such situation when you don't know if you will live tomorrow thank you very much so thanks a lot anastasia we are really impressed uh about your presentation it has been really interesting uh, it's hard to evaluate really the level of destruction and the 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 amount of destruction, but uh, we have at least a glimpse on what's going on there. So let's see if the audience uh, decide to make some questions. We have one from Ulf Zimmermann uh, from Germany, I guess. 
uh, and he's asking how was it possible for the water level to drop by 30 meters? Was this a result of the dam bursting? Uh, uh, it's all uh, it's all because uh, the all water come on the sea uh, uh, through the destroyed dam and uh, it spent about 10, uh, 10 days uh, to move all this water from reser reservation to the uh, Black Sea area. Mm -hmm. And uh, this the situation looks like that it's still uh, uh, ongoing and we uh, it's not stopped it and it changed again and again. So let me uh, let me explain that a little bit. So I think that the Kokovka Dam is the biggest one in Ukraine, if I'm not wrong. Uh, one uh, of the biggest. One mm -hmm. of the biggest. And so it's it's uh, empty now. I mean, the destruction of the dam has um, uh, let the water free. The water was, which, which was stored there run freely downstream and it has affected uh, almost all the protected areas which were downstream till the Black Sea, no? Is that right? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And that was the list you show before, the five national parks. And, mm -hmm. and one question on that, well, we have a, a, a slide which Jeff Pedersen has shown how is disaster risk created. I don't know if we can share this, Jeff, I'm sorry, it's too small. At least I cannot. Uh, maybe you can. Um, you want to make uh, Jeff uh, some comment on on this. There is another question from Kaja Lotman uh, from Estonia. I think. Uh, what is the most critical need to you? How we can help you? Uh, we need a lot of help. <laughs> uh, but first of all, we need to uh, help in uh, prepare research of what happened in this area. Second one, uh, most of uh, infrastructure of protected areas that on the uh, war, uh, active war, uh, is dest were destroyed. And they need cars, they need buildings, they need uh, special equipment, they need form, and so on and so on. They need all things because now they have not nothing, especially this place that were deoccupied and people returning to this place and start to work, but they have not even where to live. Okay, Alona is informing us that the Kakovka Dam uh, uh, is 100 times bigger than the biggest dam in Germany. To mm -hmm. have an idea of, of the dimensions of the water mm -hmm. which was uh, stored there and, mm -hmm. and liberated by the blasting of the dam. Mario is uh, asking, Mario Shimbov is asking if uh, has there been any recent scientific updates on the effects of how the dam breakage of the on the Black Sea? So I think the question is the effects on the Black Sea, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, we have a uh, special research about this influence because it happened only a few, few weeks ago, uh, but it will uh, uh, affect uh, because a lot of fresh water come in this uh, in uh, Black, uh, Black Sea and the state of water change and a lot of damage come in this place and a lot of dead animals come in this place and it starts to move uh, from Kherson region to Odessa regions and to Odessa. Bulgaria and so on and so on. And I even had information that uh, some species were found, found uh, in, um, in Georgia, as I know. And we don't know how it will move again and what will happen with Black Sea, but it will have influence, of course. So Alex Jarvis is asking from from uh, from Great Britain, if I'm not wrong, from South Downs National Park in in, uh, in United Kingdom. How much, if any, of the work the Ranger teams carried out before the work has been able to continue? Uh, I I think I think it's about a third part or half about not more than half of range could be work now. Uh, and uh, uh, 
so all uh, all people who work in a, a ranger system it's about four or five thousand people it means that about two thousand people could work still work but some people could not work because they have to move this place and some work on the arm some some rangers on the arm some rangers are on the army that that's uh that's one of my main concerns mm -hmm. how how is the staff of the protected areas now how many of them are still working in on site and how many of them are you have simply no contact with them because no no we have contact with them but most of people uh, leave the territory where they live if the territory occupied because they don't want to live with aggression only Ascania Nova by sphere reserve as I explained early could not leave this area uh, and uh, also scientific work and also education work they could uh, do uh, outside of the protected areas they still work with schools with university and so on they fulfill uh, open database uh, they try to do the work as, as they can <laughs> so thank you very much to the audience for the questions um, we have a question from eric baird uh, he's thanking you for the presentation and the question, let me see. Uh, my question, after catastrophe, a new equilibrium may be established. Are you considering not a return to pre-war, but a new equilibrium? I'm thinking, for instance, of wetlands reestablished downstream after the dam destruction. What do you think on that? Yes, I think possible. And when we speak, uh, about uh, catastrophic with uh, uh, Kachowska hydropower station, uh, we have a lot of questions and we have not answer right now. Uh, from our point of view, scientific point of view, they work on biodiversity. Uh, we propose to do, do not uh, rebuild this dam and mm -hmm. uh, to permit uh, Dnipro River to. Uh, to be uh, in late, in natural state, uh, uh -huh. but you don't know. We have to think in the all country. We have to think about agriculture issue, about economic issue, uh, about water supplies and so on. And I don't know how it will be, but we already start this company about uh, to save the Dnieper River in natural state. Thank you. Um... I there... saw, I saw, sorry, I saw information from part Frankfurt Zoological Society. Yes, yeah, well, we worked yeah. with them very, very, very close. And uh, they collect, as I know, they collect all, uh, money from European countries, NGOs and protected areas. And uh, we have very good cooperation and we, try, we help them to connect all parks and to prepare uh, this helping. Thank yeah, the, mm -hmm. yes, Frankfurt Zoological mm -hmm. Society are um, extremely generous. They help us also in the Balearic Island with uh, uh, Ferreret, with an endemic uh, toad which lives there in former times. So one question from Guido, Guido Trivellini from Italy. Uh, Chernobyl was one impressive example of resilience apart from not evaluable effects of radiation. So resilience is what will fix Ukraine protected areas in the longest term. This being a good point, what will be, the question is, what will be the unavoidable and definitive losses in terms of irreplaceable species and habitat? And what will have a good chance to come back? Um, when we speak, I didn't include in my presentation Chernobyl Biosphere Reserve. Uh, but it's the biggest biosphere reserve in Ukraine. It has uh, about uh, uh, 200, uh, okay, more than 200,000 hec uh, hectares uh, of the protected areas. And we saw how uh, during the last ten, uh, 20, 30 years, how nature is recovered. Uh, and it's very good example that if you leave nature as itself, it could recover itself. And we, uh, but during the war, uh, this territory was also dam uh, on damage and it, it's a lot of fire on this territory and a lot uh, of uh, special buildings, uh, Russia army start to build and uh, the radiation again, 
uh, start to be free uh, and start to move around the world. Uh, but uh, it's second time, yes. And we hope the second time it will uh, also recover. And we hope uh, that this example of recovering of protected uh, of uh, uh, biodiversity in Chernobyl zone will help us to recover in other protected areas. Thanks. Thank you. A question from Carlos Trindade. Uh, many thanks for the presentation. I have one question. In Ukraine, who controls the environmental restoration of protected areas? The Ukrainian Forest Services or the environmentalist associations? Uh, who was who has formal responsibility for carrying out this work? Uh, 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 in Ukraine, we have the system uh, of uh, inspection or, and collect information of damage for nature and, uh, and environment as all, uh, such as that responsible for governance of this all issue. Uh, it's in uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection and responsible for collect and control this all issues is uh, state environmental uh, agency responsible for manage and sometimes uh, to inspect the forestry area is forestry agency and so on and so on. Another question of Ulf Zimmerman from Moritz National Park, if we can assume that more than 30% of nature reserves are destroyed or negatively affected, what does that do to the people who work and live there, who work for nature conservation? Is there still a motivation to continue or do they see no future? Yes, uh, I tried to explain during my presentation that people still uh, care about nature and you know, on the risk of life, they do their work. Uh, and even in this time, uh, they uh, work better and work like one team uh, because it it is that helps them to survive in the, in such uh, such situation. I promise I was not going to make a question, but I mean, now it's my chance maybe um, to to fill the gap. Mm -hmm. And I would like to something you have said something quite important uh, from my point of view, which was the, or let's let's uh, we have seen the bleak side of the story. Let's let's be positive and let's try to be some light uh, on on the on the horizon. So uh, you have said that maybe you are going to adapt. You are going to change uh, the the situation you are living the world could mean a change in the in the legal framework for your country in order to adapt it to a future in which hopefully Ukraine will join the European Union, for example, and hopefully also the uh, Natura 2000 uh, network. So uh, do you think that currently your national uh, legal system concerning protected areas and your system in general, let's say, is suited to, to to the standards, the European stand, standards of conservation concerning, for example, Natura 2000. What's your view on that, Anastasia? Uh, yes, we prepare a special on the frame of uh, European Union cooperation. We establish, uh, we prepare research uh, and compare our legislation with uh, Bird and Habitat Directive and uh, rules for invasive species and so on. And I could tell the general. Uh, the situation uh, like that uh, the framework for protection of species it's more or less good, but we have not good system of control of the situation. We have good legislation, but we could not control this uh, the, um, uh, uh, how it work on the field. And if we speak about protected area system, uh, our protected is, uh, area system was established on Soviet Union rules, yes, and we have to change. Uh, but uh, we uh, proposed and uh, like first step, do not change them, the system, maybe, maybe on the next period, because we now have not uh, enough power to do this. But we develop a special law about emerald sites, how to manage them, how to establish them. This draft law now uh, considered on the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine. 
uh, but <laughs> very long time <laughs> considered, about two years. It, uh, it is in uh, Verkhovna Rada, but we could not have enough, uh, enough uh, get enough, uh, enough influence of, um, uh, of members of parliament to sign this document. And this draft law established rules of appropriate assessment, especially established rules uh, how to prepare management plans of uh, for emerald sites and so on and so on. And it's very close to Natura 2000 system. And we hope that in the future and maybe very, very close future, uh, this, this draft law start will, will start to work. But also all system, it's very difficult because we have no special agency. Uh, we speak about to establish this agency for management and governance protected areas, but now on all system about only 50 people uh, work on uh, governance of protected areas. And uh, it's, uh, it's very, very small uh, team that could not develop draft law, could not develop systems. It's could only manage and to work on the land, but not to develop. So there was an, another question from Alex Jarvis from South Downs National Park, England. What inspired you to become involved in nature conservation in your home country, Anastasia? And also one extra question. What do you think is the most unique and special aspect of nature in Ukraine and worth to to be visited for, <laughs> I, I will add. Okay, <clears throat> about first question, um, I couldn't explain. I come to this work and to the style of life uh, gradually from step to step. Uh, and I couldn't explain, it. it's like my feeling. But for the next uh, question, uh, we have a lot of special places. Yes, we have part of Capetian Mountains. We have wetlands uh, on the west part of Ukraine. We have wetlands on the Black Sea coast and Azov coast. But for me, most of unique for uh, Europe is step area. We have a big area on the Donetsk, uh, Luhansk region, Zaporizhia region with step with wild step area. Most of them they are dis were destroyed, but uh, you still can see them a lot. And it's unique for Europe. It's really unique for Europe. But now it's under the bar. <laughs> the Alex question is a good question to end with. So we will finish here if it's okay for all of you. Uh, thank you, thank you, really thank you very much to everybody, to Europark for hosting the seminar, for Anastasia for giving such an example, she and her colleagues in Ukraine, of resilience and of commitment to the protection of protected areas, even in such a hard times. I mean, it's something which is worth to admire. And uh, I can only say that we are with you and we will support in as much as we can and under uh, our possibilities, uh, your uh, current situation and the future of your protected areas. So Esther, if you want to close the seminar. Uh... Thank you, Pep. Uh, thank you, Anastasia. Thank you to all that participated um, and I can only echo those words, Europark will continue to stand firm with Ukraine, will continue to support protected areas um, in all throughout Europe in whatever way we can. And um, let's hope that there is some resolution <laughs> soon. So sure. thank you for joining us today. And um, I hope to see you again in the future. Okay, take care, everyone. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. All of you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.